All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started here. It seems like we have a lot of the group that's joined us. I'm Alicia DiCasola. I'm the development director here at Catawba Lands Conservancy in the Carolina Thread Trail. Um, thank you for joining us for today's um, conservation chat. This is our second one for donors. Um, also, thank you so much for your generous support. You make our work possible, so thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna share a few logistical tips and then I'll turn it over to our executive director, Bart Landis, and then Rusty Rizel for our presentation. Um, and then followed um, after that, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A and some discussion. So um, we recommend keeping your microphone muted during the presentation so that we can limit any feedback or background noise. Um, as I mentioned at the end, we will open the floor for questions. And at that point, if you wanna turn your mic on to ask a question, um, turn your video on so that we can see you. That is great. You're welcome to do that. You're also welcome to use the chat feature. Um, if you'd like to type out a question or a thought throughout the presentation, uh, we'll monitor those and, and ask those questions at the end. So if you don't want to chime in and you'd rather just chat and type out your question, that's great too. Um, finally, there is going to be a presentation that accompanies um, that goes along with the, the presentation. So I would encourage if you have the option to go up to view, should be on sort of the top of your screen, top right, and select the speaker side-by-side -side view. So that way you'll see um, the PowerPoint deck as well as the, the main speaker. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Um, if you have any questions or issues, Feel free to put those in the chat as well, and we'll try to help you troubleshoot if you have any um, technical issues. I think that covers sort of the logistics. So I will go ahead and turn it over to our executive director, Bart Landis, to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, welcome to our uh, second conservation chat. We, um, we hope and plan for this to be a regular feature and that you'll uh, be a regular feature with us. Uh, the intent is to provide some insight and understanding and inspiration for uh, what's going on in our region um, and the ecology and environment, um, as well as the past and the future. And you're gonna hear about all those things in our presentation today. So I'm pleased that you could be with us. Just real quick about us. Um, we got started um, as a water quality organization. Uh, so it fits nicely with what Rusty is going to talk about today. Um, SMILE was the name of the organization when it first started 30 years ago, saving Mountain Island Lake for everyone. It started at a kitchen table. Um, and now we made it 17,000 acres in seven counties and focus on clean water, wildlife habitat, <clears throat> excuse me, local farms and connecting people to nature. And this is sort of the scary part of why we do it. Uh, this is the anticipated urbanization, well, existing and anticipated urbanization of our region. Uh, and you can see as we grow, we create lots of impervious area uh, and that, uh, and you'll hear this in great measure from Rusty, that harms our water quality. Uh, it means we need to work much harder to provide good water for a whole lot more people. And here's an example. Uh, we've got a piece of property that we're hoping to be able to uh, preserve. Um, it's called Riverbend. Uh, it's on the cusp of both Lincoln and Gaston counties. It uh, crosses over. It uh, is right at um, the northern edge of Mountain Island Lake and Johnson Creek comes into Mountain Island Lake from that area. Uh, and we're working with the developer in some of the local municipalities to try to save it. Uh, so that we can uh, have a lot of green space, but even more so we can protect from exactly this. Um, that uh, photo is of Johnson Creek uh, coming into uh, the Catawba River. Uh, and all that uh, mud and sediment is coming off of the properties that are either a part of or next to uh, the River Bend property. So you can see that there's a uh, good reason for us to be interested in that property. Uh, and we hope that we can uh, get some work done to, uh, to preserve it and to protect our water quality. But on the right of this uh, slide, you'll also see that there's other stuff that has impacts on our water quality, um, primarily spills of various kinds, sewage spills, um, chemical spills, but they lead to some very uh, 
inopportune uh, situations where uh, we have fish kills, we have water you, you may not drink, uh, we have uh, water you may not swim in. Uh, so things are still a little dicey with our river system and we would like it to be better. Um, so Rusty is gonna speak to us today. Uh, you'll really enjoy uh, Rusty's uh, con uh, conversation because he's got a long history, not just uh, in his job, um, as the water quality program manager for Mecklenburg County, and he's been working on that for about 40 years, but also with his family history, and he'll sprinkle that into this uh, presentation, but his family first got to this area in 1780 and then ran the ferry, Roswell's Ferry, uh, for many, many years from about 1790 um, until relatively recently, um, and so he's got a lot of family history as well as the uh, regional history that he can share with us. So um, Rusty, we're looking forward. To, oh, I'm sorry, last but not least, for those of you who've lived here long enough, you probably ate at not his house, but his family's house, Laura's Rosell house, which was a, a great restaurant for many, many years. Um, and uh, if you've been there, you'll remember it well. Rusty, thank you very much for being with us. We look forward to uh, hearing from you and we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. Fire away. Well, thank you very much. I'm guessing y'all can hear me, right? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay, good, good. Thank you, Laura. And, and thank you all for, for letting me be here today. It's certainly my, my privilege to be here today and to talk to you. And I'm going to now try to share my screen and bring up PowerPoint. And uh, can you see that? You're on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is start out by talking a little bit about the Catawba River, where it begins, where it ends, and some of the sites along the way. And it truly is a fascinating river system. It's, it's not a large river system. Actually, it's about the 13th largest in the state. So it's relatively small, but starts up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, runs through the Piedmont of the Carolinas, it ends up in the coastal plain. So it's quite a bit of diverse topography and a lot of diversity, not only with the landscape, but the people all along the way. It's really a neat system. So the river itself stretches 225 miles and it begins up in Old Fort. And Old Fort is located up I-40, right before you get to Asheville. It's just east of Asheville. And it starts in a series of waterfalls and they're beautiful. Uh, I like to go up there once a year on my birthday. That's my treat to myself. And it's a series of three waterfalls. This is the upper waterfalls. It's the, the higher of the falls. Uh, and it flows down out of the Blue Ridge Mountains from Old Fort, runs through Marion or past Marion in Lake James. Then we've got Lake Road Hiss up near just north of Morganton and Lake Hickory and Lookout Shoals and probably near Staple, and then probably the better known of all the lakes is Lake Norman. It's the largest lake in the system covering 32,000 acres. It's the largest man-made lake in the Carolinas. And then we've got just south of Lake Norman, Mountain Island Lake, and Lake Norman and Mountain Island Lake is where city of Charlotte and a lot of the other communities around us get their drinking water. And then south of that, we have Lake Wiley. And then there are a series of other lakes and you end up with 11 lakes all created by Duke Power, Duke Energy now. Uh, first lake was created in 1910, which was Lake Wiley, and the last one in 1963, which was uh, Lake Norman. And you can see another neat little view along the way. This is my other favorite place to be, and this is the uh, Rocky Shoal Spider Lily, and it only occurs in a Rocky Shoal in the river down there in South Carolina uh, near Lansford. South Carolina and very beautiful site. Blooms, blooms in May and if you've never been there you really should go to see it. So a little bit more about the lake. We've got 180 miles of shoreline. The upper falls uh, that I just showed you earlier is about 50 feet high. Uh, we have the 11 lakes and 13 dams. Uh, and the total miles of streams and the river itself is 3,285 3, miles. And the total surface area of the lakes is about 80,000 acres. The basin itself covers about 400, almost 5,000 square miles, includes 19 counties, population of over, over 2 million people. 
and it's one of the fastest growing areas in the country. And right now, urbanization only makes up about 10% of the watershed, about 63% is forested and the rest is agriculture. But most of the urbanization, of course, is in the Piedmont here, uh, still up in the Blue Ridge, still, still very rural in nature. And that is a blessing to us because that's where our water begins and it keeps it very clean for us. So with that, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the um, some of the history, and so I'm gonna go way back in the history and talk to you about the beginning. So the 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 Catawba River was formed, as you might imagine, a long, long time ago, in the late Triassic period. It was created. And that was about 220 million years ago, and it was created at the same time the Appalachian Mountains were created. It was sort of the the drainage feature from the Appalachian Mountains as those mountain ranges were created uh, back over 200 million years ago. And this, this is a picture, a very old picture of the Catawba River before any of the dams were built. This picture was taken around 1900 and it's there near Highway 16 at Mount Nine Lake as we know it today. And as far as the early settlers of the region, as you, as we all know, they were Native Americans, Paleo Indians, as they were called. About 40,000 years ago, uh, we had these Native Americans who were inhabiting the northern Northern Asia, just across the Bering Strait up there in, in Alaska. Well, the Bering Strait dried up during the Ice Age. About 12,000 years ago, these Paleo Indians migrated from across the Bering Strait into America. And so that's the first known evidence we, have, we saw of Native Americans in the Americas coming across the Bering Strait. And they were very nomadic. They hunted buffalo, they, or not buffalo, but they hunted mammoths and they traveled around with the herds and did not really settle much at all. Around 6,000 years ago, these Paleo Indians migrated south and we think they showed up, at least archeological evidence indicates that they showed up around the banks of the Catawba River about that time. So that would have been 6,000 years ago. That's a long time ago, long before Europeans settled here, which was in the 1540s. And that's when the Spanish explorer, Hernando de Soto, marched his troops through the Piedmont and he was heading west. And he encountered these Paleo Indians, these Native Americans in the area in the Catawba Valley. And they numbered at that time only about 15 to 25,000 uh, know, po in population. And European traders soon followed DeSoto's army. And they refer to these people as, I'm gonna probably get this wrong, Catawpa, uh, which means in the Siouan language, people of the river. And so that's why we call it the Catawba River today. Uh, is after the original name of those Native Americans that were found here in, back in DeSoto's days. Well, what's happened is as the, the Native Americans adapted, as the Ice Age ended, they became less, nom less nomadic. They became more sedentary. They began to build villages. You can see there in the picture, this would be a typical Catawba Indian village dating around 1600, where you have like a wood barrier around the edge of a, a cluster of thatched homes with the main meeting chamber. Uh, they had sweat lodges and open plaza of, for the carrying on of games and dances and such as that. And the houses were mainly fairly small and you'd have the whole family living in one house. They were rounded on the top and they were made of bark. And at this stage, they were, as I said, given up their nomadic ways. They were very sedentary. They didn't travel very far at all. They hunted mainly small game uh, and they grew a lot of corn along the banks of the Catawba River. So they planted a lot of crops. Okay. So there were actually um, many what is called Suan tribes. This is a, a branch of uh, the uh, Native Americans and they were called the Suan. And 
as probably a lot of you, if you watched Westerns like I did all the time when I was growing up and still do, uh, you would probably recognize the Sioux as being a Western tribe, but the Catawpa were actually a branch of that Western tribe that had migrated east. And there were a lot of these Suan speaking tribes located in this area. You had, for example, the Sugary, uh, and they were located in the area in Charlotte. And that is the area they were actually located where Hidden Valley is today in the headwaters of Sugar Creek. And the Sugary is the name that uh, the sugar came from the name Sugary. But you also had the Watery, the Congaree, the Santee, the Winya, the Seawee. All these people inhabited the Catawba Valley along with the Catawba. Um, by 1750, by 1715, most of these tribes had pretty much disappeared. So what happened is as the Europeans continued to migrate into the area, they brought with them smallpox. And the 25,000 population of Native Americans in 1500 soon dwindled down to just a couple of hundred. And they were pretty much decimated by disease brought over here by the Native Americans. And the Catawba and the other Suan tribes along the Catawba were very, very friendly, particularly the English. They were, uh, they really embraced the English and helped them out a lot. And it was their downfall at the end because they, that it was the, the, the Native, the uh, Europeans and the diseases they brought the enemy ended up wiping them out for the most part. And really around 1700, the tribes had dwindled down to such a point that they kind of all united under the Catawba Indian name. And that's really all you have today is left of the Native Americans is the Catawba Indian nation, which of course, as you know, is down there in Rock Hill and it still exists today. And there's some really neat things about these Suan speaking Indians, these Suan tribes, they, uh, the Waxhaw were, for example, you see, I think some of the pictures there, uh, the Waxhaw Indians, uh, again, part of the Suan nation, part with the Catawba, they would place sandbags on their foreheads as Indians and, or when they were infants. And this gave them a kind of wide eyed flathead look and uh, they were called flatheads. And that's the reason they thought this made them more ferocious. And the Catawba warriors in general were known as being very fierce. And the nation claimed at least 11 other tribes as their enemies. And, but as I said earlier, they strongly allied with the English. So the more en enemies you had, the stronger you were considered to be. So back in the day in the 1700s, 1600s, the Catawba Indians and all the other Suan tribes around them were very fierce, very, but very loyal to the English. Okay, <clears throat> so by 1660, uh, you had the, the Europeans who had established themselves very well into the area, and they were under the rule of King Charles II of England, and they were, King Charles II had appointed eight Lord Proprietors, and these eight Lord Proprietors were sort of the governors of the area, and at that time, this was part of the Carolinas and the Carolinas included part of Virginia, all of North and South Carolina and part of Georgia. So it's quite a huge territory. And by 1700s, they had new, numerous colonial settlements all up and down the Catawba Valley. And this is uh, when this population explosion occurred to the Europeans is when the Native American population dwindled in the 1700s. And of course, we know today by 2020, the population of the Catawba Indian Valley with Charlotte being the largest population center is about 2 million and about 3.3, uh, about a little over 3,000 of those 2 million folks are part of the, the Catawba Nation. So been a quite a change. We moved from our predominant population, Native Americans, of course, now to today when Native American populations have dwindled and most of the population is, uh, of course, the Europeans. Um, Another interesting thing about the, the history of the Catawba is very fascinating. And, and that is that these, these Lord proprietors and King Charles II of England that governed the area, they very much wanted the area to be settled. So they wanted people mainly from England and Ireland uh, and Scotland to, to come and live here because they would create a commerce which would uh, bring money into the area and would make them rich and make them famous. So 
they actually uh, allied with a guy by the name of John Lawson, who was a, a naturalist and a historian. He, he was really quite young. He was just 26 years old. And he was contracted, went on contract with these oil proprietors, and they paid him to come across here and explore the Catawba Valley. Now, John Lawson was an Englishman, and he arrived here in December of, of 1701. And he traveled 550 miles uh, over just a matter of a couple months. And he noted a lot of things and he kept a journal, a very detailed journal. And he published a journal when he was done with his travels. And it's called A New Voyage to Carolina. And you know, you can, you can go online and, and read this thing. And I've got the book. And it's fascinating all that he, he really writes a lot about the Native Americans, which is where I got a lot of what I presented to you earlier. And that, that I don't know, it's my, one of my flaws. I'm very fascinated by that and uh, all the different uh, culture that they had. And it's, it's fascinating reading. And he actually, John Lawson, founded two towns in North Carolina, Bath and New Bern. And in 1711, he was killed by the Tuscarora uh, Native Americans who uh, who were resistant, unlike the Catawba Indians, who were very receptive to the, to the European settlers, the Tuscarora were very resistant, and they ended up killing John Lawson. But the, the, what John Lawson brought to the table when it comes to the Catawba Valley is he, he developed a very, very accurate, very scientific account of the Catawba Valley, the animals that lived here, the people that lived here, the geography and the geology of the area that ultimately ended up attracting people to come live here, which was the ultimate goal of the, the Lord proprietor. Some of the animals that he documented, buffalo. So in 1700s, we had buffalo that were would wander around what is now Trade and Trine Street, right here in downtown Charlotte, we had buffalo. Uh, and they were smaller than the larger plains buffalo but nonetheless, they existed here for, for many hundreds of years. And a lot of the things on this picture, I think like the, the raccoon, the possum, and the elk. Now, all these things are found throughout the Catawba Valley, bear, raccoon. Uh, these were things that John Lawson noted during his travels. And he actually, he, he pinned this picture, or drew this picture. One of the things he said about a possum, and this has fascinated me when I read it, is being uh, from Europe, uh, you know, they don't have possums over there. We, we have lots of possums here in Mecklenburg County and, and the area around us, but he thought it was a wondrous thing and he called it the wonder of all land animals. Uh, he also, one of the things that he noted was in his diary that this was an area abounding in many and delightsome rivulets. And of course, a rivulet is just an old English word for a creek. And the Lord, Lord proprietors really touted that, that comment out of his, out of his uh, diaries, his account, because they wanted to encourage millers to come to the Carolinas because they realized that if they could take these delightsome rivulets, all these creeks, and they can encourage millers to come over here and build their water mills, then that would lend its way to communities because the only source of power in the 1700s was running water, natural running water. So uh, these Lord proprietors succeeded. They had a lot of millers to come over here all around in the Charlotte area and gas in Lincoln County, practically every creek that had year round flow had a mill along its banks. And this is a picture of the last operating mill in Mecklenburg County and one of the larger mills that operated for a hundred years. And this is the Whitley mill and if you're familiar with Beatty's Ford Road in the western part of Mecklenburg County, right before it intersects Mount Holly Huntersville Road, it crosses over Long Creek. And right there is where that Whitley Mill is. And the foundation of that mill is still there. And millers became leaders of the community because this is one of the, certainly the first commercial structure uh, built in the area. And there were large buildings. So you had meetings held there. Millers became mayors and community leaders and population centers grew up around the mills. You would have other stores that would sell the grain uh, that was uh, ground from the corn and the wheat. Uh, so they, it really lended itself to growth in our area. So that was kind of how 
uh, you know, the towns in Mecklenburg County and really the other counties around us got their, got their start around these ancient or these earlier water mills. But so the running water did other things for us too back in, back in days long ago. It, it provided for one of our, our earliest and our, our best, uh, I guess, economic drivers, which is fish. So back before there was really much agriculture in this area, there were lots of fish in the Catawba River. And the Native Americans really took advantage of this early on. And they would build these rock fish traps. This is an actual trap, pretty old picture. But you can see it's just a series of rocks that will channel the fish as they, as they swim downstream into a, a narrow opening in the end where there'll be a trap. So they would check the trap daily and of course get the fish out of the trap and they would sell them or eat them. And uh, the Native Americans did this a lot. It was one of the early commercial enterprises. Of course, they would exchange it for other goods. And when the Europeans settled here, they of course would exchange it for money. So it became uh, very important early on, very early on in the 16 and 1700s as our area was just being settled. Later on, uh, cotton was grown very much, very predominant crop in the Catawba River Valley. The, the soil in the area is very good and the wide floodplains along the Catawba River lended itself very well to growing cotton. But uh, another very popular crop was corn. And my ancestors grew a lot of corn uh, on their farm. And my, my grandma used to always laugh and said that she thought it was because we made a lot of liquor. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I can see you probably would make more money selling liquor than you would corn. So it, it could be so. But agriculture uh, kind of followed the fishing industry as the predominant uh, economy of our area in the 1800s. Another thing that's kind of interesting about the Catawba River that, that a lot of people don't know about is, okay, so put yourself back in 1800. There were no paved roads. There was no NCDOT. Uh, all the roads that were here were dirt, and they were maintained by farmers who had mules and drag pans that they could use to help scrape roads. Well, they would scrape the road that benefited them a lot of times in front of their place or roads they might would travel frequently. Most of the roads were an absolute wreck. You get stuck in them when it rained, they were all that red mud and they were slick and the railroad wasn't here yet. The railroad didn't show up until the 1830s. But you you've got all this cotton and you got all this corn that it's gotta get in the market and the market uh, was not so much in Charlotte, although they did have a pretty good marketplace in Charlotte. Most of the, the market was down there in Charleston. So that's where most of the Europeans would buy, buy the goods is down there in the Charleston area. So what they would do, if you were up here on, in the Catawba in Mecklenburg County, let's say, for example, then you would build a flat boat. And these flat boats were about 60 feet long and seven feet wide. And you could get 50 bales of cotton on a flat boat. And you would pole it down the river. Now remember this is before there were any dams. So you would you could make it all the way down the river. Remember that picture I showed you of the Rocky Shoal spider lily? Well that shoal was a big deterrent to getting further downstream. So in 1823 they built a canal and the canal was two miles long. It was 12 feet wide, 10 feet deep, and it had five different locks that enabled you to to go around those shoals through that canal and through those series of locks. Usually they would pull you with a team of mules or horses and you would be able to work your way downstream past the shoals. And from there, you could go all the way to Charleston Harbor and sell your goods. Of course, you got the boat down there, then you would sell the, tear the boat apart, sell the lumber, sell the boat, get yourself some horses and uh, ride back to, to Mecklenburg County. And that was pretty much a standard practice from the early 1800s until around 1840, 1846, when the canal went out of use and it was replaced by, by the railroad. And right now, this is a, you probably know is that if you've been down there, it's Lansford Canal State Park in Chester, South Carolina. And you can still see these canals and still see these locks really a neat thing. I've often thought, you know, I'd, I'd just really like to take that boat ride down the top. That'd be neat. 
So another thing about the Catawba, so it, it offered a mode of transportation if you were going south, but not north because you'd be going against the current, nor east or west because the river itself was just wide enough and just steep enough to where it, it impeded travel. So in the early days, there were no bridges, as you might imagine. Uh, we didn't know much about the use of steel in construction in the 1700s in the early 1800s. So bridges were made out of wood and wood breaks apart fairly easy in high water. So they were very expensive. And so there were no bridges to speak of. So the way you cross the river is you would use either a ferry or a ford. And a ferry, of course, uh, is a boat similar to the flat boats that you pull across the river and the ford is a shallow spot in the river usually would have a rocky bottom and you could pull your wagon or ride your horse across the river without getting stuck. And in 1911, just crossing into Mecklenburg County alone, there were 13 ferries and two fords. And this is an early map of Mecklenburg, 1911. You can see uh, up here is Beatty Ford, one of the fords in the furthest part of the county. Beatty's Ford Road is named after that. Uh, Ford, and then you've got the Rosell Ferry. So that that's the ferry that uh, my ancestors. And here you see, I didn't turn on the names, but there you go. And there's the Tuckasegee Ford. This is where the Whitewater Center is located, and there's the Rosell Ferry that my ancestors used to run. So this is the uh, Rosell Ferry, and it is located now. It's located where. Highway 16 crosses over Mount Nile Lake. And this is my great grandfather standing on the ferry. And what you would do when you got to one or the other bank, if the ferry wasn't there, they had a big old bell and you'd ring the bell. And the ferry was operated pretty much 24 seven. So the family would take shifts and you know they would hear the bell and they would push the ferry to the side of the river you were on. And this particular stage of the ferry operation is a cable pull, but Earlier on, they pushed it with poles across the river. So you turn that crank on that cable there and it would pull the ferry across the river. They always get you money before they took you across and they would carry you across the river and let, up, let you off. So the road coming out of Lincoln County to the ferry on the west bank was called Plank Road. And when you got off on the east bank, that road was called Ross's Ferry Road and that road carried you to Charlotte. So the ferry was kind of an important link between Lincolnton and Charlotte, which were two centers of commerce in this area in the 1800s. And so this, this is what it would cost in, in 1920, which is when this picture was made. Uh, you can see it's pretty, pretty reasonable prices. I often wondered, uh, you see a loose horse or mule is five cent. One person, it's kind of interesting how they set these prices. We won't go into that. Okay, this is what it would be in in 2020 with inflation. It's still pretty reasonable. So got off the road, the road on the rock, off the ferry, got on Robinson Ferry Road and went to Charlotte. And the road still bears the name, portions of the road still bear the name Roswell's Ferry. People say Roswell's, it's Roswell, Roswell's, all the same. So the ferry shut down in 18, in a number of times, but uh, it started operation in 1790 and operated all the way through 1926. And during that time, it was all operated by the Rosell family. And it shut down a couple of times when bridges were built at the place of the ferry. So in 1855, the uh, Western Plank Road Company in Charlotte entered into a contract. And I obviously got a copy of this contract. And it is neat to read. But it entered into a contract with my great, great, great grandfather who agreed to shut the ferry down after the bridge was built. And in exchange, he could use the bridge free. And, but he would, op, would agree not to operate the ferry because it was a toll bridge. Everything was toll, no NCDOT. So the Western Plank Road money, that company, that's how they made their money back through the toll. Well, that's how the ferry also operated. So they shut the ferry down and they operated the bridge and everything was, was good for a while. And of course, the family farmed both sides of the river, so it's very advantageous to them to have a bridge rather than a ferry. Um, so then the Civil War shows up. And during the Civil War, 
uh, part of uh, Sherman's army. So I'm trying to get myself oriented here. Okay, so part of uh, Sherman's army, General Sherman, if you remember, of course, he marched over Atlanta and uh, there was a cavalry detachment of his arm, army under General Stoneman who was sent north up into Lincoln and Mecklenburg counties to destroy transportation routes. Well, they showed up there at the Roselle Ferry Bridge and, and of course, my ancestors by then, you know, you kind of heard things and they heard that the, uh, that the Northern troops were marching from Lincolnton into uh, Charlotte, it, it, excuse me, I'll call them Yankees, but so the Yankees were coming and the family sent my great, great grandfather out to pull the planks up the bridge and the family story goes, they sent him because he was a deaf mute and they figured if the Yankees shot at him, he wouldn't hear the bullets and the shots. So he wouldn't be distracted and he'd get the job done. And he did, he pulled up enough bridges, enough planks and the Raiders could not get across the river and they were unable to make it to Charlotte. And then they torched the bridge and um, the ferry reopened again. And the ferry operated, this is uh, the ferry that, that operated there after the uh, Northern troops burned the one that was there. And then in 1916, so uh, the fair, the bridge was washed out by the, uh, the Great Catawba River flood. And basically what happened is, and on July the 8th uh, through the 16th of 1916, there was uh, two hurricanes basically collided over the North Carolina mountains in the headwaters of the Catawba River. And on July 16th, one day alone, one day, 22 inches of rain fell in 24 hours. And on the 17th of July, 1916, the Catawba River rose, now get this, 44 feet above its normal level, 44 feet. So all the bridges, all the ferries, and all the structures along the banks of the, of the river were completely destroyed, including this this is the Roselle Bridge, and you can see there ain't nobody using that bridge anytime soon. 80 lives were lost. Estimated damage caused by the flood was $500 million, and still, that's the that 22 inches in 24 hours is still the state record for rainfall in any 24-hour period, and they still claim it's probably one of the worst natural disasters, even with all the hurricanes we've had since that ever hit the Carolinas. So it was it was a huge big deal if, if you lived here. So I had a special treat back in uh, 18, uh, 1980s. And this is, uh, I got to meet with my great aunt, uh, Ella, and she was born in 1890. And this, and this was in July of 1984. So, so she was a, a, an older person, she was 94. And she talked to us about the flood. So I've got a little recording here. Let us help, Yeah, I don't forget. Uh, we saw our rocking chairs and things going down the table and uh, went home, fed. Uh, and then we went to bed. So we didn't have to go to bed and go to bed. We went to bed and we went to bed. see the bridge go down. They saw the bridge go down. And I was in bed, close by the window. And your dad came by and he, he said, Ella, I said, well, uh, the bridge is gone. It just sounded like somebody had died mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. So a house go down, a woman sitting on the porch coaching. So it's hard for us to imagine what it would have been like, but that bridge was a lifeline to a whole other community on the western bank where cousins, aunts, and uncles, churches, and schools were all located. And basically they were cut off because all the bridges were gone. And the bridges uh, stayed gone uh, until they were rebuilt in the 1920s. And that, that bridge that was built in the 1920s stayed there until the 1960s when a modern bridge was built. And then in the 1980s or 90s, they built the second bridge. And all that is located, all that that happened, the ferry, the bridges, the flood, the washing, all that out, is where Brookshire Boulevard across the mountain not only all that occurred. So there's another thing that's kind of interesting that it amazes me how very little we talk about this, but after the Civil War, 
the Catawba, the Catawba River Valley, the population of the Catawba River Valley grew tremendously. And that was because of the textile industry. The textile industry showed up after the Civil War. And of course, what they were doing is they were, they were taking cotton and they were weaving the cotton into yarn or cloth. And that's what they were doing at these mills. And they employed a lot of people. And by about the, the 20th century, more than half the working population in Catawba River Valley was in some way employed by one of those mills. They sprung up in every community up and down the Catawba River. So why the Catawba River? They used the Catawba River as a power to, to generate or operate the mill, the flowing river. And this was, again, before any of the dams were built, and we'll talk to you later, that's why the dams were built actually, uh, to provide power to these mills, these cotton mills that took the raw cotton and spun it into cloth and yarn. And people started leaving the small farms for the more steady income of the mill. And most mill workers lived in homes provided by the company, the mill. And they came to be called mill villages. And I think you may hear that term on and off now today. And they, these are very tight knit community. They were mainly country people come to the city to live, to work in the mill. And that they, they were, the wages were, were low, unfortunately. Some of the early problems with child labor abuse occurred in some of these meals. There's a lot, of, a lot of bad stories about that. But the bottom line is, I think it, it was a great, great uh, economic boost to the region. My grandfather grew up in a mill village. And one of the things that always struck me is he said that uh, they were poor, but nobody really cared because everybody was poor. So they didn't really know they were poor. They were all poor together. And that was sort of the story behind the mill village. So this is a Mountain Island mill, and this was built along the banks of Mountain Island Lake in what we now know as Mount Holly. And during the 1916 flood, this is one of the casualties. It's completely washed away. And they got their power to operate this mill from a dam near where Mountain Island Dam is today. And then this is a mill in Gaston County down here, a mill village. And you can see the mill in the background. So here's another one my really thing I think is really fascinating. So did you ever wonder how so many dams got built on the Catawba River? Well, first and foremost, the first dam was built that created Lake Wiley, and it was created to provide power to a mill in over in Gaston County. So, but it but it all kind of started in 1895, and at that time there was only one hydroelectric plant in the country. And that was at Niagara Falls. And this is a picture of it. And it is just downright ugly. I got to say it. He can't know the, no other thing to say, but it's ugly. Well, there was a fellow by the name of William States Lee Sr. And he was a, a young engineer, again, 1895, early 1900s. He was an engineer from South Carolina. And he worked on this project. He worked on the Niagara Falls up there in New York. And it occurred to him at the time, hey, we got rivers down here in the south. Why can't we build these on these, uh, these dams on these rivers? Well, in 1905, uh, William Lee and a guy by the name of Dr. Uh, Dr. Walker Gill Wiley met with a gentleman by the name of James Buchanan or Buck Duke. And Mr. Duke was a, a textile giant, a very wealthy man. He's the benefactor of Duke University. And they approached Mr. Duke with the idea of building these dams. And he gave these gentlemen, invested with these gentlemen, $50,000 to begin what uh, came to be known as the Catawba Power Company. Catawba Power Company later became Southern Power, that later became Duke Power, that is now, in, after 1997, we know it as Duke Energy. And of course, the story only started there many, many years later, 50 years later, as a matter of fact, the Wiley Dam was finished in the 1910, and the last dam built was Lake Norman, was Cowan's Ford Dam, which was built 52 years later. And between that span of time, they built 11 dams. And one of the things, the two, two factors contributed to the building of the dams. One was through creating the power necessary to operate the mills, 
And once the, the dam and the mill got established, then they would begin to provide the power to the mill villages. So of course that was an incentive, but the other incentive was that flood, that 1916 flood. And Duke Power, Duke Energy to this day says the dams are not built for flood control, but they do provide flood control. Uh, and it was that flood control, the promise or the hope of that flood control preventing another 1916 flood that made it a little easier for people to sell their land, to give up their farms, to build the lakes and the dams. So his grandson, William State Lee's grandson, Bill Lee, later became a chief engineer. He, he helped build Lake Norman and later the CEO and, and, and Duke Power president. So a little history there that's always fascinated me. So the, the of course, lakes, the dams were originally built for hydropower um, and for flood control, but guess what? That's, that certainly is something that we still appreciate today, but at least in my mind, I think most would agree, the highest and best use of those waters is a drinking water supply. So you've got these very nice reservoirs that are retaining this water that is very, very clean, and you've got these populations all around in the Catawba Valley that are drawing from those reservoirs as their sole source of drinking water. And today, right now, there are over, there's over 600 million gallons of water a day drawn from the Catawba for drinking, industrial, power generation, and agriculture. And this is a, enough water to fill St. Panther Stadium two and a half times every day. That's a lot of water. Um, and it is absolutely essential that we protect this water, the quality of this water uh, for future generations. It's certainly the river has shaped our past. Certainly it sustains us in the present and it, it's gonna dictate our future. And all these communities we, we build and we're continuing to grow in the Catawba Basin uh, um, can only be sustained if we learn to appreciate the value of the water resources that we have in the Catawba River. And that's the end of my presentation. And I hope I didn't go over, but I think I might have. For that, I apologize. No need to apologize, Rusty. It's always fun to hear all this great history um, and know so much more about the river. Um, you guys, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask one really big question, Rusty. What's the most, what, what's the biggest threat to the Catawba River today? Stormwater pollution. Stormwater pollution. Um, and what I mean by that is that Every time you cut down trees or take some natural area in the Catawba watershed, and that's all the land that drains into the river, uh, every time you do that, you do some, some bad things. So this is what happens. So those, those trees or those natural areas, uh, they soak water up and they recharge the groundwater and they keep uh, there from being an overabundance of water rushing into the rivers and in the creeks, which which causes flooding, but it also causes destruction of stream channels and scour and muddy rivers and muddy water and all that stuff, which negatively impacts the quality of the water for our drinking water supplies. So that's one thing it does, increase volumes and velocity of water. The other thing it does when you cut the trees down and put all this asphalt and rooftops down, uh, not only do you increase the volume and velocity of the water due to the impervious area, but you cause more pollution because these impervious areas have tire wear from automobiles, they have spillage from industrial commercial activities, people putting fertilizers out on their lawns and various other activities. And when it rains, the pollutants are carried to surface waters and cause significant ne negative water quality impacts. And the other thing which is really kind of interesting to know is that we're finding all these what we call emergent, emerging contaminants. These are contaminants that we used to not even know existed that we're finding in plastics that are occurring in the parts per billion that we couldn't even measure 10 years ago. And these contaminants are making it into our waterways and the stormwater pollution. And this pollution it, is bad. You know, we, we kind of mastered, we, we have good technology. We're able to treat wastewater, uh, you know, and, but the stormwater, we hadn't figured that out and we really need to get ahead of that curve or it's going to really uh, cause some des des devastating impacts to our water resources. 
And that's why it's so important to conserve land. Because if you don't build on it, uh, if you leave it natural, um, then you don't have either one of those problems. And that's why it's so important. That's the, really the only way to protect a water body from stormwater pollutants is to conserve it. We have not figured out a way to remove all pollutants and to control volume velocities the way we need to. Thanks, Rusty. I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to squish together a couple things that have come into the chat. Um, how have you seen the uh, water quality of the Catawba either improve or decline in the last 20 years or so? That's the, that's the, I think that's the good news in that the, the Catawba River has, and we've monitored the, the quality of the water in the Catawba River since 1970. And we have not seen any appreciable decline or improvement in the water quality in the river, in the main channel of the river. And that is because, and I attribute that mainly to the, to the Blue Ridge and the mountains that have remained largely undeveloped. Uh, now we're beginning to see much more development up there, but we are not seeing those negative impacts yet. But where we do see negative impacts are in some of the coves. So the water from these developed areas is washing into these coves and is causing a lot of negative impacts. And the impacts aren't significant enough yet to cause the impacts to the main channel. So most of the negative stuff we see is in the code. The main channel still remains a good supply. Thanks. Um, we've also got uh, Sean Bloom, our biologist with us. And so I'm gonna ask this next question for both of you, for both you, Rusty and Sean. Tell us what the Catawba Watery Management Group does and how you've been involved. Sean, you want to go first, or Rusty, you want to go first? Hmm. I should unmute. Um, so I can probably speak more to Catawba Lands Conservancy's involvement with the Catawba Watery Water Management Group. Um, we have participated with them through the Catawba Watery Clean Water Initiative, uh, which is a project, a joint project with the Foothills Land Conservancy, Catawba Valley Land Trust, and the Conservation Fund. Um, and we have worked alongside the water management group to help inform um, some of their water planning projects and to emphasize uh, the availability of land conservation to help protect our region's water quality and water quantity. Um, we, we really want to push the idea that the solution to our regions, to preserving our region's water quantity for drinking water industry does not just lie in gray infrastructure, pipes and treatment plants, but also in the green infrastructure, um, stormwater, enhanced stormwater BMPs, um, forested uh, riparian buffers and land conservation. Uh, land conservation efforts, stream restoration and mitigation efforts. Uh, that, that's really our involvement is to uh, promote green infrastructure alongside the gray infrastructure that's already in place. And um, the water management group overall, it's led by, the, by Duke Energy and the 11 municipal water supplies uh, along the um, South Fork River and the main channel of the Catawba River. And they work together to help manage the water quantity and water quality in that basin to ensure um, an adequate supply of water for industry and drinking water. Thanks, Sean. And Rusty, you might talk about the origin of that group. Yeah, that's uh, I, that group is hugely important. I, I don't think it's possible to overstate the importance of it. And here's why. We share all this water from Blue Ridge Mountain all the way down here to Charleston Harbor, but we had no shared link of communication. So we weren't talking to each other. The, the, the water was doing all the flowing and we weren't. There was no means or no line of communication. That's where the, the Catawba Watery um, Water Management Group, that's what they do. They, they link us together and we're able to talk about the issues and as I'm sure everybody on this call knows, is that's the beginning of all uh, solving all problems is you first got to start talking about it. And that's what that group does, is it engages us all, creates a forum. We can come together and learn and talk, negotiate, and, and it's hugely important. And that group was formed when 
the Catawba when Duke Energy saw its FERC relicensing for the Catawba Water Reef Project. And the, as part of that process, this group was formed and the funding set up for this group. And that whole FERC process, I think, created a lot of very positives. But by far and away, and I think we'll see this on into the foreseeable future, I think that group was the, the greatest positive we saw because I mean, I, I was around long before the group was formed and I've been around now since the group was formed. And I can tell you, it's, it's a tremendous difference. A lot more people know about the river. A lot more people understand the river. Uh, we now have a means of talking one to another and sharing funding and helping out with problems. And it, it's just hugely important. Thank you. Alicia, are, are we, do we have space for anything else? According uh, to my phone, we have about four minutes. So if there's any other questions, if anyone would like to sort of chime in and ask a question or, or take a moment to chat, we can certainly probably uh, address one more. And we'd love, we'd love to hear from you. If there isn't another question, I'll ask one more. Um, because it relates to what Sean and, and Rusty just said. Um, the water re, Catawba Water Remanagement Group uh, has funded a study called the RTI model. And if one of you would tell folks about that, because that's a very hopeful development. I'd be happy to start with that one, Bart. Um, so the RTI model, that is a project uh, in partnership with the Catawba Water, re, water Management Group and the Catawba Watery Clean Water Initiative. And the idea behind this RTI model is to take a really um, granular level, looking really close, not at just uh, watersheds, but subcatchments. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with uh, how watersheds are broken up, uh, these are gonna be at the lower than a HUC 12 area. Uh, that's approximately gonna be maybe one square mile in size. Um, I may be off on that, but very small, very um, high detail analysis. And the purpose is to identify those areas where potential land conservation efforts can have the most beneficial impact on protecting our region's water quantity and um, preventing increased sedimentation into our waterways. And it's looking at how land conservation impacts those uh, water quality and water quantity. Uh, but in addition, it's looking at um, the impact of climate change and how land conservation can mitigate um, what we are expecting to see um, as our climate changes, um, how land conservation can um, prevent negative effects from in, um, potential development. And not that it wants to stop development, but in areas where development is expected in these important catchments, how can that development take place in a way that allows our region to grow, but also balances that with protecting um, our water quality and our water quantity, which is the reason we can grow. Uh, it's because we do have so much water right now. Um, but it's predicted by 2050 that our water usage will surpass the water availability. So it's really important that we act now um, to um, move that timeline out. Thanks, Sean. And one other thing that's really useful about the model is that it uh, takes all that data and it translates it into cost. So when a uh, municipal body is trying to evaluate uh, tax revenues from new businesses, new homes, things of that sort, it can look at the cost of doing it in various places. To, to Sean's point, if you do it here, it costs a lot more than if you do it there. So it provides them with good data to make good decisions. Yeah, to, to expand on that, it, the current model looks um, at the benefit, the economic benefits um, from recreation on our lakes, um, the economic benefits for, for property values on the lakes, and the uh, health benefits also of having the uh, additional tree canopy. So we actually have a new version um, with some updated data and economics 
which uh, we'll, the Catawba Watery Management Group will be looking at a draft next week. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to publish that um, here in the next few months with uh, more up-to-date data. Thanks, Sean. And I, I believe we do need to stop now because I think we've hit the witching hour. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Rusty. Uh, we really appreciate having all your great perspective on this stuff. It's especially fun to hear the family history. Uh, we really appreciate you being with us. Thanks, everybody, for being here and hope you'll come the next time. Thank you. Thanks, Rusty. Oh, thank y'all. Thank you, Rusty.